Welcome to Cardboard Hunt Hunter. Where are my games? What we're doing today is the one cube challenge, which we have, I don't know why I keep saying we, the Cardboard Hunter is one person, it's me. Uh, so I have been invited to take part in this challenge with a lot of other really spectacular content creators. And I will link all of them in the details of this video. Let me go through the names real quick. I want to shout them all out. Obviously myself, Cardboard Hunter. We got Chits and Cardboard, Board and Savior, Bad at Board Games, Rolling with Beard, One Board Family, Game Brigade, Tantrum House, Economic Board Games, and Gaming Rules. What a killer lineup. These are so many content creators that I have been a fan of for years, and I'm very excited to take part in this challenge with them and you can too go ahead and make your own video uh or jump in the discord share it there share just what games you would choose if you were to make a video <laughs> but what we're doing today is what games would you keep if you had to consolidate your entire collection down to one calyx cube that is 13 inches by 13 inches by 15 inches and that's a unique challenge. If it was just like, what 10 games would you keep? Well, my 10 games would be pretty large. I would say over half of them wouldn't fit into a Calyx cube by themselves because I'd want something with a whole bunch of expansions. So I had to approach this really strategically. I wanted to make sure I covered all of the different areas of the board gaming hobby that meant so much to me. I didn't want to miss out on anything, but I had to go with titles that would fit in here. So let's see what we've got. Ta-da! <laughs> My cube. So we're going to go through each one of these games, but to give you a little bit more details, I am not restricted to just what you can see here. There are other games shoved back there. So long as they properly fit in the cube, even if they're behind other board games, they count. I couldn't find anything to fit in here and that drove me crazy, but that's fine. That's fine. Um, so let's go through our games. What do we have? So right here at the top, Mind Bug. So Mind Bug is spectacular. Have you ever wondered what would Magic the Gathering be like if they finally fixed that broken mana system after decades? And the answer is Mind Bug. So Richard Garfield, one of the main contributors to Magic the Gathering, one of the main designers, also contributed to Mind Bug, and he did approach that issue and tackled it by completely removing the mana system and saying, you know what? What if you could just play your biggest card turn one? That's, that's it. What if? What if? But the catch is, instead of having mana, each player can steal from their opponent twice when they play a card. So if I were to drop my biggest card turn one, I can do that. But then my opponent's just going to steal it, and now I'm facing that big boy. So... That's the challenge here, is you're basically, you're fishing, you're tossing something out. You know, this is juicy, you sure don't want to take that? Because once your opponent has finally taken the bait and used their steal two times, well now it's anything goes, and the boxing gloves are off, and you can start bringing the big dogs out. And it's so good, the game plays very quickly, very small decks, uh, every time you're playing is basically different cards. I cannot recommend this game enough. You will be laughing every single game, but I'm telling you, it's not just comic relief. It is brilliant game design. And over here, we have Nana for our next little small game. Now, Nana is a brilliant memory game, but what makes it special, also the English version is called Trio. You can typically get it on Amazon, and honestly, the cards are in better quality. I just love the little Japanese version, but I probably would recommend Trio over Nana, but Nana or Trio is a memory game where you're not only playing out of your hand or the face down cards on the board, you're also playing out of your opponent's hands, primarily. And it's so hilarious. And basically your cards are numbered in order in your hand. So you rearrange them from lowest to highest and you can only play from the outsides of your hand. So you have all these juicy cards in the middle and you, you know, you'll have some of them in your hand you can't wait to get to. And then your opponents play those cards right out of your hand. And that's very rude. And it's hilarious for a small family weight card game. Top five at least. I mean, it's so good. I can't recommend it enough. So moving on to the top, we have Reiner Knizia's 
Carcassonne the Castle. So yes, Reiner Knizia did tackle the classic Carcassonne. I wanted one really classic game in my collection, but it had to have a twist, and I had to squeeze more Knizia in if I could. And so, yeah, my choice was Carcassonne the Castle, which to me is the best variant ever made because it's two player only, which is primarily the way I prefer to play Carcassonne, but it takes that little puzzle that Carcassonne is all about and turns it into an abstract strategy masterpiece. So it gets way more tighter. It's not like building all the way out. You're building within the castle walls. So it's more condensed. You have a lot more agency in where you're placing things. And there's so many brilliant scoring mechanics here. It's so good. I mean, you know Kanitsi. He's he's gonna add some really cool twists to the way you score and held nothing back. This game is brilliant. And I honestly can't believe that it's not like a $150, $200 on the secondhand market. Like, I think copies go from like 40 to 60 bucks. Okay. Scout, of course, you know, Scout is so good. Do I really need to tell you about Scout? Scout is a brilliant trick taking game that you can teach to anyone. You can play it three players and it still is incredible. I mean, obviously I squeezed a whole bunch of other small box games back there too, which we'll talk about, but I, I could not not include Scout. This is one of those games that I throw in my pocket or in my bag almost anytime I'm going somewhere that I can't take a full game bag with me. This one just never gets old, man. It's great. Everyone should have Scout in their collection. And everyone should also have cockroach poker in their collection. This is a bluffing game and oh my God, is it good. Cockroach poker is hilarious. Basically, you have a handful of creepy crawlies, bat scorpions, frogs, cockroaches, flies, and you're gonna hand one to someone else at the table and say, that's a rat, knowing that's in fact not a rat at all, that's a toad. And they're going to look you dead in the eyes pierce into your soul and determine how much they believe what you're saying and it's so funny because if they they're basically going to say you're lying or you're telling the truth if they get it right then you take that card and you play it face up that's a penalty point you are that much closer to losing the game and if they are wrong about saying if you're lying or telling the truth then they do that they're that much closer to losing the game and this game is so brutal because there's no one winner there's only one loser everyone else wins collectively it's so funny oh my god absolutely love it all right moving into the first big box santiago which is my favorite auction game of all time i've always described this if Reiner Knizia made a splatter game. And what makes this unique is there are two unique auctioning phases. The first one is your typical auctioning phase for a resource, which in this game is a different type of crop. The game has you all competing on the same board to choose the best crops and plant them in the most desirable locations. So you're spending big dollars and you only get one chance at the uh, bid it, during this round to get the crop you want the most. And then, the second auction comes into play, which is amazing. It's absolutely brilliant. What the second auction is, is whoever was the lowest in the previous auction or passed, they control the irrigation. Because like I said, you're planting crops and also looking for the most desirable locations on the board. These locations are ground that may not be fertile yet. So maybe I got a really good crop, but right now it's not actually irrigated and <laughs> that thing's gonna start drying up and I'm gonna lose all that money I just spent on it. So the second auction is actually everyone taking turns bribing the person who controls the irrigation and you can make some really good money during this turn and it's hilarious. People are, no, nah, don't go that way. In fact, I will pay you X amount of money just not to let that person get the irrigation this round. And you can either choose to take their money and go the direction they wish, or you can say, you know what? I don't care what none of you guys have to say. I don't need none of y'all's money and I'm gonna actually send it the way I want to. It's amazing, it's so satisfying. Paper money though, so, but you know, you gotta deal with that with some grails, let's be honest. All right, we got a big boy up next. Now this box is pretty large, larger than I would have ideally liked for this challenge, but 
I couldn't leave this one out. This one's pretty new to my collection, and oh my god, I'm in love. This is Fallen Land 2nd Edition, a post-apocalyptic board game. So, if you've ever played any other storytelling games, it, not only is it storytelling, it invites you to do a little role play. And I love games like that. Like, if you've ever played Tales of the Arabian Nights, it's so fun, it's so thematic. The stories you're all collectively sharing and experiencing together make that game, I wanna say one out of every three, maybe one out of every two at most, are experiences I'll like talk about for the next year. They're so good when playing the game. But sometimes it does fall a little flat. That's just the nature of most storytelling games. This one though, it gets a little bit more right. It, it, this one would actually replace Tells if I was forced to choose between the two, I, I guess clearly. Tells is actually a smaller box. But what makes this one good is this is that storytelling times a thousand, but it's also in a Fallout type theme. It's that post-apocalyptic world. So where the United States and part of Mexico and Canada used to be, all of these new nations are rising up and just trying to rebuild and take control of the of different territories. So it has you picking one of these upcoming nations and putting together a team of five post-apocalyptic adventurers and loading them with loot and venturing out to try to gain resources and bring them back and go do encounters and missions. And all of these encounters and missions are so thematic and they come with so much flavor text, the story, and you're reading it out loud and everyone's getting to experience these stories together. And the actions really fall in line well with it. You know, you're either gonna fail or succeed. There's a few other things that can happen. And it all feels thematically accurate as you're just going through this wasteland and avoiding radiation and other players, because there's also PVP. It does get a little long with a lot of players. It says one hour per player, which is pretty accurate. And, you know, I kind of wanted at least one game that could go pretty long if I was choosing only one Calyx Cube. Let's go back here real quick. Mafia de Cuba. So I needed to have at least one true hidden roll game. And if you've ever played a hidden roll or hidden trader type game, like Werewolf or Two Rooms in a Boom, there's so many other ones. The reason I love Mafia de Cuba is because if you've ever played one of these games, you know that sometimes some of your players you introduce to it might have a really bad experience. They don't like the whole, I have to lie to a group of people. They Some people are very uncomfortable with it and some people don't know they're uncomfortable with it until they experience it. And I promise you, playing a three hour, 60 person ultimate werewolf game and figuring that out is not the way to do it. <laughs> but this game actually goes over very well with those kind of people. I've actually never had anyone that's had that anxiety ridden, really un uncomfortable situation with it because what this does different is you get handed the box and inside the box are several different roles that you get to choose on your turn or you can choose to steal the diamonds from the Godfather. The game is about the box getting back to the Godfather and the Godfather trying to suss out who all at the table has stolen the diamonds. So it allows players to not choose those roles that they may be more uncomfortable with. It's absolutely brilliant and just a little safer for a, a game night if you're playing with players that you don't know are gonna be comfortable with the more intense hidden role games. And then, of course, if we're talking about a collection with limited space, you knew I had to bring more Oink games. First up is A Fake Artist Goes to New York. This is a brilliant, little how would i describe this well a it's a drawing game but basically one person's going to choose a word or, or phrase or a topic let's say pig for example they are going to hand everyone else at the table a card and that card will say pig but one person's card will have an x on it they are the fake artist this game and basically everyone's trying to suss out who that fake artist is and the fake artist is trying to not let people know that. So everyone will have a 
pin that's a unique color and one at a time you'll get handed a little notepad and you're going to draw a line and you're hoping that when you draw this line you're tipping your hat to the other real artist and letting them know look i'm a real artist too without giving away too much information for the fake artist to pick up what you guys are drawing so they can draw something that looks convincing and it's this really great tug of just I got to give enough to let people know I'm really the, a real artist without giving so much that, well, now the fake artist knows exactly what we're drawing. So absolutely brilliant. One of the best oint games in my opinion. Next up, startups. To me, probably the best oint game in my opinion. That is if I'm not including Scout, since Scout technically was just Oink doing a reprint. They did not come up with that game. So I'm gonna give it to Startups. Startups is a brilliant economic game, a stock trading game, but it's not just a stock trading game condensed into a small box. They actually have some really unique, brilliant mechanics, and it's so good, so easy to teach, so satisfying. And for me, someone who absolutely loves economic board games, just having something pocket size that I could teach to anyone and talk them into playing it, it's good. It's really good. The last oint game we have here is Mask Men, which is a super clever, very unique set collection game. I absolutely love it. It's been a while since I've played this one, so I really cannot do justice to give it a full explanation, but I promise you this is top five oint games in my opinion. And I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone, but Bus, of course, had to make its way in here. Now, I was torn on this one because I don't know if I would call Bus my favorite splatter game. I, I, obviously, I love Bus. Roads and Boats is probably my favorite splatter game. But what was tough is out of these smaller splatter games, what one would I really want? And Food Chain was really tugging me. The Great Zimbabwe, if you ask me right now, do you want to play Bus, Food Chain, or Great Zimbabwe? I think I'd say The Great Zimbabwe, but I, I love them all so much. They're all definitely top 20 games of all time to me, but you know I love my splatters. But I chose Bus because Bus is the easiest to teach, and it's the easiest to make sure everyone has a good time. Because with splatter games, everyone knows Food Chain Magnate, you can lose in the first round and then you're stuck there for an hour or so just losing the game. And you're, you can have a bad time because of that. I try to talk people through that and let them know the game is more about experiencing it and learning it. Don't let that beat you up. But some people just can't get past that. And Bus is one of those games that I feel like I have enough control of during my teach and as we go that I can make sure people are having a good time. Not only can I teach the game, I can steer the game. And if I'm going to have a limited collection and I'm going to have something strategically deep, then I definitely felt like it needed to be one that I think I could keep it on the tracks. And this leaves us with Reiner Knizia's Magnum Opus, which is Tigris and Euphrates. This was a tough one too, because I probably table Samurai a lot more than Tigris and Euphrates. And I love Samurai, it was so hard not to bring it. But between the two, I'd already chosen Bus as the easier game in the splatters. And I felt like, well, now it's time for me to get a complex one. I don't want the whole cube to be nothing but the easier games to teach. So I decided let's have something with a little meat on the bone. So Samurai is a very simple streamlined abstract strategy that really is kind of based on Tigris and Euphrates. It kind of takes the core concept and really simplifies it. But Tigris and Euphrates, there's so much going on. Basically, you're playing on the same board and you're building up these kingdoms as the game's progressing, scoring points, trying to get control of the various kingdoms. And there's two types of main conflicts. You have a revolution, which is where one player has control of one of these cities and another player starts a revolution right in the middle of it to try to kick the other player out and then them take control of that city. And then you have wars, which is where two large cities have grown so large that they finally touch and now they have to fight 
over who's going to stick around. The other one's going to get kicked out. And this turns into a big scoring opportunity. And it's so satisfying. There's so much here to chew on. It's one of those games that you're going to be scratching your head the first couple times and you have to explain that to your players kind of like food chain magnate you're playing it to learn it the first couple times but if you can stick with it if you can get past those first couple plays and keep coming back it is satisfying in a way that very few board games are i mean this is so many people call it one of the greatest board games ever made for a reason i needed something with some serious meat on the bone that we could keep coming back to and that is Tigris and Euphrates for me. And what do we have here? I thought we were done. This is Lewd Dungeon Adventures, an adult role-playing game for couples. <laughs> How'd that get in there? <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll cut that. So thank you so much for watching. This was so much fun. Please, please go to the details of the video and go check out all of the other content creators, One Cube Challenge, and you know, tell them in the comments how hard I spanked them. Because let's be honest, Tantrum didn't think about bringing Fallen Lands, did you? <laughs> but speaking of Tantrum, the Tantrum Con is coming up. I think that's in January and I am anticipating going. So if you're going, please let me know, join the discord. Let's play some games. And until next time, keep hunting that cardboard.